Hello, everybody, um, and thank you for, to, for coming to the colloquium series. I think this is the last one um, publicly for this quarter. Uh, today, we have Natalie de Leon from uh, Princeton University. Uh, she did her undergrad at Stanford and then a uh, PhD and a postdoc at, at Harvard. Um, she's won basically two award, too many awards to name, uh, and today we're going to hear about her research. Thanks. And uh, I would just say also that questions are welcome throughout the talk, so just feel free to raise your hand and ask. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing, uh, mostly focused on quantum sensing and quantum computing. Um, but I'll just mention really briefly that you know there's a larger scope of things happening in my lab. Um, so about a third of my group is working on nanoscale quantum sensing based on nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. Um, another third of my group is working on uh, technologies for quantum networks, uh, particularly focused on integrated nanophotonics and new solid state defects for building long distance uh, quantum communication nodes. Um, and then uh, there's a new effort in my group um, that started basically right before COVID on trying to find new material systems for quantum computing in a very different kind of quantum platform, uh, which is superconducting qubits. So I don't have enough time to talk about uh, anywhere close to everything. So um, I'll just focus on sort of this first piece and, and this last piece today. Uh, OK, so um, in, for quantum sensing, uh, the main platform that we are interested in developing is the nitrogen vacancy center in Diamond. Uh, so uh, this is a point defect in Diamond where you start with a diamond lattice that's just you know all carbon everywhere. Uh, and if I take two atoms out of this lattice and replace one of the atoms with nitrogen and then leave the other uh, empty spot as a vacant site, uh, then what you get is this little defect in the diamond that looks a little bit like a molecule. And it turns out that this, uh, this NV center will give rise to electronic levels that are very, very far from the valence and conduction band uh, extrema in diamond. So you have something that really acts like a very localized uh, defect. And the, the band gap of diamond is 5.5 eV. So you have this enormous headroom to even have very confined uh, orbital electronic uh, excited states uh, for this NV center. So you can have closed kind of optical transitions that don't involve the rest of the diamond lattice whatsoever. So to first order, you can sort of think of this as like a little trapped you know, molecule that's sitting in the solid state. Um, so the reason that a lot of people are interested in this defect is that it is unique in that, uh, first of all, it has extremely long spin coherence times even at room temperature. So you can basically you know, create a superposition state out of the ground states uh, of the NV center and have that live for milliseconds, even at room temperature under ambient conditions, which is really remarkable for a solid state object. Uh, and there's also a very convenient method for optically manipulating and measuring the spin at room temperature. I can take something as unsophisticated as this green laser pointer and um, you know, focus it down on an NV center. And if I shine green light, then if I start in one of the spin states, I'll just keep on going into the excited state and coming back down and emitting photons. But if I start in one of these other spin states, there's a spin dependent inner system crossing into this dark state. So basically the whole NV center gets a little bit dimmer. And that way, by just counting photons over time, uh, I can get a readout of the spin. So this gives rise to something called optically detected magnetic resonance. So I can read off you know, the energy difference between these levels by just looking at, you know, looking at how many photons come back when I shine green light. And you can see there's a little dip here as I drive this magnetic resonance. And you can do things like read out the local magnetic field for the NV center by just plotting you know, where this dip is. So you can see things like Zeeman splitting, which gives you a projection of the magnetic field. Um, and I can even do coherent manipulations of this electron spin, again, all at room temperature with basically a green laser pointer. So uh, based on these properties, the fact that you have long spin uh, coherence times even at room temperature, uh, this convenient scheme for optical readout and initialization of the spin, um, people have been really interested in trying to push the NV center as a technology for nanoscale sensing and imaging. Um, so the way that you should think of this, uh, I guess like ontologically, is that we can take all of the techniques that people have learned from you know, about almost a century of magnetic resonance, like NMR and ESR, and then combine it with the last quarter century 
of a single center optical microscopy, where you just use lenses to focus the light to address a single center, so that you can now do things like magnetic resonance, but on the single atom or single molecule scale. Um, so for example, if I just plot dipolar coupling between this you know, NV center and you know, other things in the vicinity, and I draw contours of equal dipolar coupling, you can see that these things change very rapidly on extremely short length scales, right? The length scale here is nanometers. Um, so I can now do something that looks a lot like magnetic resonance imaging, right? Where you like stick a person in a large pore magnet and then use the fact that you have a magnetic field gradient to get spatial uh, information about what's going on internally. Uh, and here, I, because I have this point dipole, you can think of it as being something that gives you the largest possible magnetic field gradient and therefore it gives you the highest possible uh, spatial resolution. Um, so people have been interested in trying to use the NV center to study you know, bulky molecules attached to the diamond surface, uh, small volumes of, of liquids. Uh, so you can now think about doing sort of multiplexed, uh, like multi-well plates, uh, but now for NMR. Um, and then there's a, a large community that's working on developing NV centers for condensed matter sensing. Uh, this is an example from Patrick Malatinsky's group in Basel, where they took an NV center and scanned it over a 2D magnet. And then we're able to learn uh, things about the nature of magnetism uh, in this new material just by plotting the magnetic field as they scan the NV center across the material. Um, so just to show you sort of the, the power of this, uh, you know, the, the potential power of the sensor, uh, this is an example that maybe takes a lot of these ideas to their, um, I won't say logical conclusion, but <laughs> something like logical conclusion, uh, which is that, uh, so this is some nice work from Tim Tamaniao's group at Delft from a few years ago, where they took a single NV center inside bulk diamond, um, and then applied a lot of NMR pulses um, to map out the very precise positions of all of the carbon-13 nuclei in the vicinity of the NV center. So this is the positions of something like 20 or 30 carbon-13 nuclei, and they have them really localized to, you know, far below the lattice constant. Um, so this is really incredible. And I think it's, it's, it's clear that if you could do something like this, but not just looking at stuff inside the diamond, looking at, you know, arbitrary targets, that this would be a very powerful technique. Yes? Does the presence of carbon-13 in the diamond lattice affect uh, the, the nitrogen? Um... The spin? No, yeah, just like the, the computability of the nitrogen insertion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's, you know, the natural abundance of carbon-13 in the environment is, you know, 1.1%. So if you just synthesize a diamond, you're going to get about 1.1% 1, 1 of carbon-13. And it turns out that the NV coherence properties are really dominated by this carbon-13 bath. Um, so one thing that, but however, it's a slowly varying enough bath that it's actually pretty easy to just you know, do quantum control type techniques to get away from. Um, and also a lot of people have made progress on synthesis of isotopically purified diamonds and something like 99.999% carbon-12 is now um, relatively routine to synthesize. Sorry? So it's not a big problem? Uh, it, it's certainly not the problem that anyone's worried about right now. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so what we would like to do is now take these NV centers and look at something that is more interesting than just you know, what's inside of a diamond. Uh, and um, there's one huge problem that arises, uh, which is that if I want to take this NV center and bring it close to you know, some sort of arbitrary target that I'm interested in, this is a, a physicist version of a protein, a bunch of, you know, like a blob of a bunch of protons, uh, then in order to have high enough sensitivity, I need to get very close. And also to have high enough spatial resolution, I need to get very close. And when I in order to get close to the sensing target, I also have to get close to the diamond surface. And while we're very good at making extremely high quality, high purity bulk diamond, uh, mankind is very bad at making, um, I would say surfaces in general, uh, but diamond surfaces in particular, because diamond is an extremely, is, is the hardest material in the world. So it is very hard to polish uh, and you know, process, and it's, it's just hard to control the surface. Uh, so you have all of these surface defects that give rise to their own noise, and that noise obscures the thing that you're trying to look at. So one of the ways that we know this is that if you just plot the coherence time of NV centers as a function of their depth away from the surface, uh, 
what you see is that if you're far enough away from the surface, you just get this you know, millisecond coherence time. But as you approach the surface, we have this horrible power law scaling such that when, you know, by the time you're within a few nanometers, you have below a microsecond of coherence. Um, so this is really bad. <laughs> and this is fairly universal. Uh, this is a data set from our group. Each, each color is a different sample. So we see this across many samples. Um, and there are many other groups who have done sort of similar work and similar parameterization that see either this amount of surface noise or worse. So uh, our group sort of set out um, to try to understand the origin of the surface noise so that we could get rid of it. And the, the challenge here is really that you know, the NV center is very sensitive but it's also pretty non-selective, right? All that it tells you is how much noise it's seeing at any given time. And it, you can do somewhat more sophisticated things and, and figure out the spectrum of that noise, but it's very hard to figure out what the microscopic origins of that noise are. Um, so, uh, you know, there's another approach which is trying to just characterize the surface directly by using surface spectroscopy techniques. Um, but, uh, you know, these techniques can be quite challenging. There are a lot of technical uh, issues, especially with insulating substrates like diamond and carbon background um, and things like that. Uh, but maybe more fundamentally, uh, a priori, it's actually not obvious that the surface spectroscopy techniques will give you the right type of information because they tend to probe much larger areas than the local environment of the NV center, right? The NV is looking at a few nanometers around uh, itself, whereas the surface sensitive techniques are usually probing something like tens of microns or even millimeters of material, uh, and they tend to be much less sensitive than the NV center. Uh, so we did the dumb experimentalist approach, which is let's just try lots of different surface spectroscopy techniques, see what we can learn about these surfaces, and zero in on surfaces where we know that we have good NV centers or bad NV centers or worse NV centers and look for some sort of differential signal. So the idea is to try to correlate uh, some of this more traditional surface spectroscopy with the types of measurements that we can do in detail from you know, individual NV centers to characterize uh, the nature of the noise. So you get this sort of alphabet soup of lots of different uh, surface spectroscopy techniques. I won't talk about most of them because everything in gray is something that we tried that did not give us useful information. Um, but you know, we sort of zeroed in on a handful of techniques that did seem to give us some good uh, correlation with the NV properties. Um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, and near-edge X-ray absorption fine structure spectroscopy. All of these are roughly the same, which is that you send in a photon and you kick out electrons, and then you measure either the energy or the um, fluence of those electrons as a function of photon energy. Um, so I won't go into an extremely detailed story about what we learned with surface spectroscopy, but I can at least give you a couple of examples of the type of information you can learn. Um, so for example, we sort of immediately figured out that uh, most of the community you know, prepares oxygen terminated surfaces because that's supposed to be good for NV charge state. Um, however, we found that uh, even two samples that are nominally prepared in exactly the same way, as in, you know, I buy them, I stick them in the same furnace, I stick them in the same etcher, um, so this should be kind of, uh, you know, a control test of some sort, can have extremely different uh, characteristics, uh, both from the NV center coherence uh, perspective and also from the surface spectroscopy. So these are two surfaces that started with very, very subtly different polishing techniques. And then you put them through this processing and you end up with these runaway surface roughening processes that take small differences in morphology and really amplify them. Um, and then uh, what we can see in X-ray absorption spectroscopy is a huge difference in the spectrum. So everything above 290 is the band structure of diamonds, so it should be there. Everything below this stuff down here is defect states that shouldn't be there. And you can see that the rough surface has this very high density of defect states compared to the smooth surface. So there is a direct measurable consequence in terms of the electronic structure just from the surface morphology. So this means you have to be a little bit more careful with your A-B testing, right? You can't just kind of prepare things and then measure them. You actually have to measure what it is that you made and try to understand uh, what the electronic structure looks like. And based on um, a lot of pain that I won't drag you through for we could talk for like four hours if you wanted to sit through a really long seminar. Uh, we developed a, a process for creating uh, you know, pristine, 
very smooth, highly ordered oxygen terminated surfaces um, that you know, essentially involves trying to prepare a nice surface, remove the damage from that surface, introducing a different type of damage, and then sort of iteratively processing until you get to something kind of nice. So um, uh, the analogy here is that it's like you have a, a mouse problem, and then you release a bunch of cats, and then now you have a cat problem, so you release a bunch of dogs, and then hopefully at the very end, the gorillas die in the winter. Um, so that's, that's where we are now, and we can do this oxygen annealing step where we get this very smooth, well-ordered surface. Um, so what we can do to try to understand what we did is zero in on these last two surfaces and uh, do some comparative surface spectroscopy and NV spectroscopy. So I won't walk through this in detail, but basically we can do spin coherence measurements on the same NV centers before and after this last step, and we see that the coherence time is extended by a factor of a few, and that we can do something called dynamic decoupling, where we drive the NV center with lots of pulses to probe the high frequency noise, and we see that we see this improvement across you know, all frequencies. Um, we can also take advantage of the fact that the NV center is a spin one defect and do this relaxation spectroscopy that sort of allows us to disentangle magnetic noise from electric field noise. Um, and then put all of this on kind of one nice combined plot where we look at the electric field noise as a function of frequency and the magnetic field noise as a function of frequency. And we can see that we're really dominated by uh, broadband magnetic field noise. Okay, so that's from the point of the view of the NV center. And then in surface spectroscopy, what we can see is that before and after this last step, actually the X-ray absorption looks broadly similar. You know, I have a peak here and then like a shouldery thing here, and it basically looks the same over here. But the huge difference is that before and after this step, I have a big change in the polarization dependence of the signal. So um, our argument is that these surfaces are actually chemically quite similar because they give rise to a lot of the same features, um, but you have a, a, a huge degree of disorder that washes out this polarization dependence uh, that we only recover with this last oxygen annealing step. And then similarly, we can see that the electron affinity of the surface actually changes by um, one and a half EV after this last step. So the surface disorder has a macroscopic consequence. It really shifts these bands around quite a bit. Um, so this is our sort of maybe combined model that we start with all of these defect states that come from surface disorder, and then we create a much more well-ordered surface. And the punchline is that by doing all of this, we're able to extend the coherence time of NV centers by about an order of magnitude. Um, this actually hides the full, uh, the full degree of improvement because here, what you can see is that for high frequency noise, you actually have this saturation of the T2, so you kind of stop winning before you do this last step. But then uh, after this last step, you just keep on winning with more dynamical decoupling. So depending on what metric you wanna use, we have a one order of magnitude improvement or even a two order of magnitude improvement. Uh, so with our dynamically decoupled T2s, we can now routinely get around 100 microseconds within, a f within five nanometers of the surface. Max. Uh, starting with the motivation of detecting proteins on the surface. So um, kind of what are your requirements for doing something meaningful there? Yeah, so um, I cut that part out of my seminar for time. <laughs> um, but I think there's, there's several, uh, let me try to say something that is short and disciplined. Um, okay, so I'd say that there are sort of, um, there are three problems. One is this spin coherence problem. And there, um, we're sort of right at the threshold of what you, you know, of being able to detect. Um, I mean, people have already detected single proteins, basically. Um, so the real question is, how long do you have to integrate for and can you measure anything interesting? Um, so I'd say that we're right around where you can see a single protein. Um, the second question is, can you hold the protein there long enough uh, in a state where the protein actually looks like a protein and not just like a crashed, you know, horrible, denatured thing? Uh, and that nobody has solved yet. So the part of my talk that I cut out was where we're working on um, techniques for wet chemical functionalization of the surface to be able to put these you know, big, bulky, delicate things on, on the surface. We've made a lot of progress along those lines. Um, and then the third that people don't like to talk about as much is that I think there probably is still a lot of innovation on the um, pulse sequence and you know, measurement side. Um, because if you just put sort of rough numbers to it, right now, like, okay, people can probably see a single protein, but are you going to be able to measure any dynamics, you know, on, on meaningful timescales? And I think nobody has written down a scheme yet that, 
that makes it a clear case <laughs> that you should be able to see something interesting. But we also have some progress towards that that is related to the thing that I'm going to talk about right now. Um, is there another question down here? Can you go back to the maybe one or two slides? Yeah, this one. Yeah, so this kind of crazy picture of the, after the Triassic thing and then also doing the Yeah, can you provide some physical uh, intuition of like how this happens or how, how, does, the, how does the order come about? Oh yeah, um, it's um, it's 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 uh, it's very straightforward and dumb. <laughs> so when you do this oxygen anneal, you're actually controllably burning the surface. So after the triacid clean, you know you just have some big mixture of groups, and uh, and there was nothing that set that order to begin with because you started with basically a almost graphitic carbon surface after your annealing, um, after surface relaxation. So here the idea is that you burn off this first layer, and then you controllably oxidize, and then you get out this. Uh, this very well-ordered surface. Is yeah. the final surface, is it quite inert, or do you have to worry about know, that changing over time or interacting with the atmosphere? Um, so it is. it appears to be very chemically stable over time. Like, we'll see the same NV properties uh, in the same diamond without doing any subsequent processing for, you know, we'll, like, bank it for months and then take it back out. Um, the main thing that happens is that in almost any storage conditions, you always get um, like accumulation of junk out of the atmosphere. So you have to have a good cleaning strategy for dealing with that. Okay, so let me just um, tell the quickest possible story uh, about one of the types of uh, sensing techniques that we are now developing based on having these shallow NV centers. Um, so uh, usually when people use NV centers to try to learn something about, for example, a condensed matter system, um, what they would traditionally do, and I put traditional in scare quotes because this field is only like 10 or 15 years old, so nothing is very traditional, uh, is that you just measure the projection of the magnetic field or the magnetic field noise at a single NV center. So I just ask, you know, here's my one NV center, uh, what are you seeing in terms of magnetic field or noise? Um, and you know, this is an example from uh, Misha Lukin's group where they were looking at transport in graphene and what they could see in a spatially dependent way is some increased noise that comes from you know, an interesting effect from electron phonon coupling during graphene transport. Uh, so the question that we started asking, uh, this is you know, really work that's led by a postdoc in my group, uh, Jared Rovney. Um, this was sort of our dumb COVID theory project, <laughs> was uh, you know, we're all stuck at home, let's like, think about weirder things. Uh, can we learn anything if instead of just looking at the projection of the magnetic field on a single NV center, we look at two NV centers simultaneously and then uh, try to look at correlations in the noise that the, or the signals that these two NV centers see? OK, so, um, so the setup here is I have my two NV centers. Each of them is staring at some correlated noise that comes from, for example, the condensed matter system that you're trying to study. And then they all have their own uncontrolled, uncorrelated noise that probably comes from things like nuclear spins in their vicinity. Um, so now how am I going to you know, look at the correlated noise versus the uncorrelated noise? So um, for the experts in the room, all that I do is a Ramsey. So I just uh, you know, tip the, the spin onto the equator so that it processes in a magnetic field. Um, and then I'm going to tip it back to figure out how far it processed and use that to read up the magnetic field. And the only small difference here is that instead of doing um, you know, pi over two and then pi over two right back, I do a little pancake pulse around the other axis because, uh, because now I'm just going to look at the variance of this signal. Um, okay, so I do this for both of my NV centers, save all of the data, and then I just compute the correlation. So I really just take the data traces and compute a Pearson correlation at the end. Um, all right, so uh, what does it mean to, com or what are all of the parameters that go into this Pearson correlation? So there's some underlying phase distribution that comes from your magnetic field um, which is what we're actually trying to measure. But then on top of that, when I do this final measurement, you have something called quantum projection noise, which says that you're not going to be able to convert this phase information perfectly. Um, and then worse than that, on top of that, there's something called readout noise, which is that I also can't read out my state perfectly. Uh, and it turns out that for the NV center, the readout noise is the dominant term. Um, so if I look at uh, conventionally, if I look at these two NV centers, and I just say, how many photons do I get per unit time? One of the things that people don't like to talk about with NV centers is that actually per shot, you only get something like 0.03 photons. 
Okay, so now your probability of getting a correlated event where you get two photons from two NV centers simultaneously is extremely, extremely low. Um, so this seems like it's just a showstopper, <laughs> that you can't do these measurements at all. Uh, but obviously I'm talking about this, so we figured out a way around it. Um, and the, the saving grace is that you can do things like convert the spin state into a charge state that is much, much easier to read out, and you can do that with much higher fidelity. Um, so this is work that um, I was part of in, in Misha Lukin's group from, you know, while I was still a postdoc. And at the time, you know, what we demonstrated is that uh, you could convert this spin with a spin-dependent uh, ionization, and then now you have these two different charge states. So you map the spin to a charge state, either NV minus or NV zero, and these two charge states have very different spectra, so it's very easy to tell them apart. And at the time that we published this, you know, we said, okay, this is great, you have this really high fidelity, but we are actually uh, uh, pretty discouraged about this technique because uh, what you incur is a lot of overhead from this extremely long charge state readout pulse of something like many milliseconds. So if all you were trying to do is build a magnetic field sensor, what you really care about is how good can you do with uh, some unit of time. And so nobody's ever going to do this because if it takes you, you know, a few milliseconds to do a single readout, you don't actually win over conventional readout. However, here, because we have to look at these correlations uh, where you care about readout noise to the fourth power, now we really care, right? And we're willing to take this overhead in order to, um, in order to be able to see this correlation. So the way to kind of um, parameterize this is you can ask what is the minimum sort of amplitude of magnetic field noise that I can measure with a signal to noise ratio of one for some total experimental time. And um, if I had optimal readout, which is just quantum projection noise limited, I would have this curve here. So to get to a nano Tesla, you know, you're talking about seconds of integration time, which is pretty civilized. Um, for conventional readout to get to a nano Tesla, I would have to get a million seconds just to get to a signal to noise ratio of one, which is an unacceptable fraction of somebody's PhD. So we can't do that measurement. Um, but now if we do this enhanced spin to charge uh, conversion, we can get this back down to something like thousands of seconds, which is now sort of doable. Um, okay, so that's the theory. And now what we want to do is experimentally implement it. Conceptually, this is very simple. All you have to do is build the same confocal microscope for looking at single NV centers, but then just build two separate channels so that you can interrogate two NV centers at the same time. Um, in practice, it turns out that uh, it's quite tricky to measure two things at the same time uh, because you get lots of trivial correlations from things like uh, laser intensity noise or the table shaking and mechanical instabilities and things like that. Yes? Uh, I mean, it's optically resolvable all the way out to the field of view. So a couple hundred nanometers out to 100 microns. Um, so here's an example where, you know, we got this plot and we saw, oh, look, you have this great correlation, hooray. Um, but then I asked, okay, let's just point shift the data and make sure that this is real. And if this was a real correlation, it should just go away. But instead, what we saw was this periodic signal that turned out to be uh, from one of the table legs on the optical table touching. So there was just a, a little bit of transduction of like footfalls into the, uh, into the experiment. Okay, so after beating down a lot of noise, uh, we now um, I think have like the best, the best and most stable single NV experiment in the world in order to build this thing. Um, and we can now detect correlated magnetic noise. So here's two NV centers that we can look at in a confocal microscope. Um, and then now if I do, you know, um, this pulse sequence where I try to prepare them, look at the magnetic field noise and then compute their correlation, then here, uh, if I don't expect any correlations, I can now bin the data as dark or bright for NV1 and NV2. And you see that this, you know, basically doesn't look like anything. Uh, but then now when I apply a two megahertz signal that should be driving both of them, I see this nice checkerboard pattern, which tells you that when NV1 is bright, NV2 is bright, and when NV1 is dark, NV2 is dark. And then, because these are spins, I can do a trick where I now just prepare them on opposite sides of the block sphere. And what I should measure is a perfect anti-correlation. And you can see that this uh, checkerboard pattern reverses. This is data. This is not, this is not theory. Um, and, uh, and OK, and here's, here's what it looks like in the time domain. As I, as I sweep this time delay, then I'm basically changing my sensitivity to this 2 megahertz signal. And you can see that I have a correlation peak and an equal amplitude anti-correlation peak right around 2 megahertz that goes away as I go away from 2 megahertz. 
OK, so what can I do with this? Uh, one of the things that I can do with it is now disentangle whether or not my NV centers are staring at correlated or uncorrelated noise. So if I, if I take a single NV center, you know, if I take some coherence curve, I'll see, let's say, these two peaks that come from two different sources. And then I can use that to construct the spe spectral density of noise and get out two peaks. But that doesn't tell me anything about the spatial structure of this noise at all. Um, but now I can combine this with this covariance detection. And lo and behold, you see that only one of these peaks appears as a correlation. So now I can label these peaks as correlated and uncorrelated noise. So here's an example of that in action. Um, here we have a narrow band source that we're applying intentionally. And then when I do my two NV centers in orange and gray here, I see two peaks. And then when we do this covariance measurement, you see only one of the peaks shows up because this other peak was actually from uh, local nuclear spins. Okay, so we're able to clearly label one of them as correlated, one of them as uncorrelated. Um, this is another really interesting case where uh, instead of looking at these narrow band sources, what we can do is apply a very strong white noise source to both of the NV centers and kill their coherence right away. So now their coherence time is much less than a microsecond. And normally, you would not be able to do anything out in the noise, right? Out here, I don't have any coherence anymore, so I shouldn't be able to get any signal. But now if I go way out here in the noise and I do this covariance measurement, I get a little dip from these nuclear spins. So I can do nuclear spin NMR, even though I technically don't have any NV coherence anymore. And the reason that this is possible is that you don't have any signal out here, but the two NV centers are uh, correlated with each other. So in a sense, you, know, you have this phase random signal from shot to shot, but the two NV centers are moving with each other. So that you, what you have is common mode noise. So by looking in this covariance channel, you can remove the common mode noise and then sort of get back, get back your NMR signal. Okay, enough people are nodding that I, <laughs> I think it's okay. All right, so then the last trick that we can do is that now if you have two NV centers that happen to have two different spin resonance frequencies, um, which you can do by picking out NV centers that have different orientations with respect to the magnetic field, now I can independently address them with different microwave tones. And I can play this trick where I can set an arbitrary time delay between the first NV center and the second NV center, and then look at this correlation as a function of time. And then this gives me some probe of temporal dynamics. So now here, what I'm looking at is a phase random signal, right? So shot to shot, it has a random phase. But because I'm looking in correlation, I can reconstruct this phase coherently just by scanning this delay time. And then similarly, if I now turn up the phase noise on the signal so that it's very short, uh, you know, dephasing time of something like one microsecond, you would normally not have any hope of measuring this with a single NV center because you would need to, you know, wait for this entire kind of sequence time and then start it again. But now I'm just limited in terms of time resolution by how well I can do with my electronics, which can be, you know, nanoseconds. Um, and what I'm able to do is, is sort of reconstruct this dephasing on extremely short time scales. Okay. So uh, just to conclude, um, you know, I think, so what I've shown you is that we can make very nice shallow NV centers, and we're now trying to use them for a lot of stuff. Uh, and what we've invented here is in this nanoscale covariance magnetometry is really a, a method for measuring the two-point correlator in the magnetic field um, at, you know, 100 nanometer to 100 micron length scales uh, and nanosecond time scales. Um, and as far as I know, there are just are not other techniques for being able to access these physical quantities. So when you look at the spectrum of sort of condensed matter uh, experiments and spectroscopy techniques, they don't have any way to measure this two-point correlator directly. Um, so I think this is very exciting because now this two-point correlator is a very natural way to characterize things like transport, um, you know, the structure factor of transport, non-equilibrium dynamics, phase transitions, and um, you know, nobody has ever asked the condensed matter theorists to calculate these two-point cor correlators because no one had a way to measure it. So now that we have a way to measure it, you know, I think we have a, a lot of condensed matter physics that we can do. Um, so you know, one of the things that we're particularly interested in is um, uh, in two-dimensional uh, materials, there is a prediction that you can go into a regime where you're dominated by electron-electron scattering. And the electrons flow, instead of like flowing like a gas, they flow like a viscous fluid. And you can even get to Reynolds numbers where the electrons flow like honey, which is very neat. 
And lots of people have been trying to explore this relativistic hydrodynamic regime with a variety of techniques, um, but have been sort of unable to get really convincing quantitative data that characterizes this phase transition. Um, and I think that we have now a shot at it by studying this, uh, this covariance channel. Um, and then there's a lot of other stuff like quantum spin liquids and, and things like that. Okay, so um, let me just skip through the other NV stuff that I'm doing and jump right into a totally different topic. But let me stop for a second and see if there are questions because I'm going to very much change topics. Yeah, I'll see you, Sean. So I'm kind of building off of Asher's question about distance and So I guess I'm imagining that if the NVs are closer, there may be, yeah, I guess, can you comment on the distance dependence and, and how that affects these? Uh, you, you mean like how close can I get them, basically? Not, not exactly how close, but would you rather use two, or like, yeah, uh, what do you get from using two really close NVs? What do you get from using two really far NVs? Oh, well, I think you, wanna, you want to just look at the distance dependence, right? So the modality that I'm imagining is you have some condensed matter system of interest, uh, if we do this in parallel, where we're just imaging everything on a camera, then I can just do all the measurements simultaneously in parallel, and then just pick whichever pairs I want to compute, and then now I just immediately get all of the spatial structure factor information that I want. Um, so that's very cool. We have a few half-baked ideas about how to combine sub-diffraction limit techniques with this so that you can get to very small length scales. I don't think it's going to be cost-free, but I think there's probably a way to do something. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, the, um, the measurement like past the decoherence. Um, there, your signal is from an individual NV's uncorrelated noise bus. Uh, yeah. So this signal here is the individual NV centers each have a nitrogen nuclear spin, and this is the NMR signal from that nitrogen nuclear spin. Okay. So so this is the correlation disappearing. So it's from the uncorrelated part. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there uh, there are a few. Um, yeah, I guess, okay, so I know Alexei Gorshkov has some nice proposals that involve entangling multiple NV centers. Um, I don't know, I'm actually not sure what the, oh, oh, sorry, no, okay, so there's a very simple method that you can do uh, using the nuclear spins, which is that you can just store uh, the phase information in the nuclear spin and then do Q and D readout of your nuclear spin, and you do get a signal to noise enhancement. This was, you know, a handful of glossy papers about a decade ago. Um, and, uh, and, and that's very straightforward. It's not really an entangled sensor. It's just sort of, you know, doing a nuclear spin-based readout uh, enhancement where you beat down this readout noise using... Uh, it's, uh, in that case, no. So the way that you would quantify it is how much better is your readout noise with all of the overhead that's incurred in your Q and D readout of the nuclear spin. So it's pretty similar to the kind of thing that we're working on with the spin to charge. But I think you can do better with spin to charge in terms of readout noise. Uh, okay, so let me jump into another topic in the last like, 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> so I'll go fast. Uh, so um, we ran around, uh, or I, gave, I, I ran around giving this talk about trying to understand surface noise uh, for improving ND centers for several years. And then um, folks from different platforms would come up and say like, hey, did you know that quantum dots also suffer from weird charge noise and trapped ions suffer from anomalous heating um, and superconducting qubits have this anomalous surface dielectric loss? And I said, no, 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 I'm not the sheriff that comes into town and solves all of your surface noise problems. Um, I'm not going to work on that stuff. But then um, just with proximity to Andrew Houck's group, um, you know, right upstairs, I got sort of nerd sniped into this problem, uh, which is that it turns out that, you know, superconducting qubits also have surface problems. So let me just talk about how we've applied some of these ideas about how you find noise um, and sources of loss to superconducting qubits. Um, so superconducting qubits are a very successful quantum platform. They're now the basis of some of the largest quantum processors, and that's led to 
you know, a, a lot of really beautiful demonstrations uh, in the last uh, five years especially. Um, and uh, one of the things that people don't like to talk about as much in the superconducting qubit world is that uh, single qubit coherence had been completely stagnant for around a decade, starting 2011-2012. Uh, so, um, you know, from the first Cooper pair boxes up to the 3D transmon, there's this really impressive march of improvement over the first decade. Um, and then basically around 2012, people started making 100 microsecond coherence time transmons, um, and that's where everyone was stuck. Um, okay. So we know a few things about this limitation. Uh, one is that the losses appear to be related to the surface, because if you make the devices bigger, their lifetimes get better. So this implies that you know, when you shrink the device down, you have more mode overlap with surfaces and interfaces. So you're more sensitive to losses at, uh, at those surfaces. And then the other kind of funny fact about microwave losses in these devices uh, is that they do not look like losses the way you normally think of them. Um, so if I gave you like a chunk of material and said, how much light does this absorb? You would just you know, send a laser through it and do Beer's Law or something and then give me some absorption coefficient and it would all be linear absorption. It wouldn't really matter how powerful that laser is that you use to probe it. Um, but what people see in the superconducting microwave circuits and many other systems is uh, something uh, that people like to call two level systems um, and all that that means is that empirically what we observe is, uh, so this is now lost tangent, so higher is worse and lower is better. Um, as you turn up the temperature, the loss goes down. And also as you turn up the microwave power, the loss goes down. So you have something that saturates, it looks like a saturable absorber, um, and the things that saturate are two level systems, right? Okay, so uh, you know there are many candidates for where this loss or noise could be coming from in a in a in a transmon. You have these big capacitor pads. You have these Josephson junctions. Um, it could be living inside the oxide of the Josephson junction. Um, you could just have dis dissipation at all of these interfaces. Um, there's also a separate problem with flux noise that could be from surface spins. Um, so we you know set about in this uh, in this pretty large collaboration at, at Princeton to try to understand where this loss is coming from and try to develop new material systems. Um, so all the work that I'll talk about right now is between um, my group um, and was led by Avik Dutta, Russell McClellan, Nana Shumia, and Leela Rogers, and then Andrew Houck's group, uh, Alex Place and Kevin Crowley, um, and then um, Bob Kava, who is a solid state chemist uh, and his postdoc, uh, Chin Kui, and then this very large raft of extremely impressive undergrads, um, almost all of whom are now in grad school at fancy places. <laughs> okay, so um, all right. So what we did was we looked at the material system that Andrew was using, uh, which is basically an aluminum aluminum oxide Josephson junction with niobium for the capacitor and the rest of the circuit. And all of this thing was fabricated on top of sapphire. And we came up with two plausible hypotheses for where the surface related dielectric loss is coming from. The first is that, um, you know, just like the diamond case, there's probably just junk on top of the surface and um, these substrate contaminants are a very likely source of loss. The microwave loss tangent of stuff is 10 to the minus three. So if I have a surface participation ratio of 10 to the minus three, that's a Q of a million, which is around where people were stuck. So this is a very, very plausible uh, source of loss. Um, the second uh, question was, well, niobium should be lossless because it's a superconductor, but you don't just get niobium metal. You also have a bunch of oxides that spontaneously form at the surface. How bad are those oxides? And what Bob pointed out is that um, he had spent a bunch of time in the 80s and 90s studying the oxides of niobium, and they're terrible. <laughs> you get every single stoichiometry. It's impossible to control. Niobium forms a different oxide if you just look at it kind of funny. So he said, this is impossible to control you should probably just switch material systems. So to address these two things, um, you know, we did a lot of work on substrate preparation, just looking at the surfaces and figuring out whether or not they're clean and smooth and you know, the same as the diamond story. And then we went and replaced the niobium with a refractory metal that has a nice oxide. So we went one down on the periodic table uh, to tantalum. And we can do um, you know, this nice epitaxial growth on sapphire. The one trick is that you have to do the sputtering at elevated temperatures to get the correct phase of tantalum. Otherwise, you end up with this uh, tetragonal phase that has a much lower TC. But otherwise, you know, all of that stuff was figured out by Dan Proper's group um, at Yale in the 80s and 90s. 
Um, and as advertised, tantalum indeed does have a very robust stoichiometric oxide, sort of no matter what, it's always two to three nanometers and it is always TA205. Um, this is very similar to aluminum. So, you know, an aluminum can doesn't rust because the oxide is kinetically limited and you just, you know, immediately form this three nanometer oxide and tantalum has very similar um, oxidation properties. Okay, and the headline result is that by doing those two things uh, and a lot of you know, fabrication and pain, uh, we were able to uh, immediately make qubits with lifetimes exceeding 300 microseconds. This is a very robust result. Every single qubit we've ever made is better than 100 microseconds. Um, so it is, you know, every, even our bad qubits are better than the best qubits before. Uh, so we've been able to now add to this little plot and you know, improve on the state of the art by about a factor of three. Okay, and uh, since uh, publishing this paper, many other groups have, have reproduced this result uh, in the Beijing Academy of Sciences. They now have T1s of half a millisecond uh, in tantalum-based qubits. Uh, the IMEC group has uh, quality factors of several million, which is um, converted into T1 about the same. Um, and then uh, most recently in uh, Michelle Devery's group, they've taken a tantalum qubit and put it in um, their GKP code, you know, bosonic error correction scheme. Um, to realize break-even quantum error correction for the first time, uh, which is very exciting. Okay, so, uh, so this is, you know, an a, a exciting uh, advance um, that was enabled by just one relatively small uh, delta in materials exploration. So now what we want to do is um, some more systematic studies to try to understand what the origin of the remaining loss in tantalum um, circuits is. So instead of building qubits where you get a very low rate of information, right? I just make a qubit, cool it down, and then say, is the T1 good or is it bad? And then I do another one. Here, uh, what we wanna do is a little bit of physics to try to understand uh, where are these losses actually coming from microscopically. And we can also do that much more rapidly by looking at resonators um, in a multiplex fashion. So we can now look at many resonators at the same time and we sort of eliminate a lot of the variability that comes from Josephson junctions and, and things like that. Okay, so the idea here is that we're just going to look at the quality factor of the resonators. So just what do the losses look like um, as a function of you know, all of the parameters that we can vary. Uh, so we take you know, one of these resonators, we get these very high quality factor resonances and then uh, just as people have seen before, if we look at this quality factor as a function of microwave power, we see that the, um, that the quality factor goes up. Um, so this indicates that we have something that is saturable. Um, and I'll just mention uh, for the experts that we have been able to sort of beat back a lot of our other systematics and packaging issues so that our high power cues are now in excess of two times 10 to the eight. Uh, which I think is the highest that anyone has seen in the community. So this allows us to see pretty subtle sources of loss, right? If we were stuck down at high power cues of, of 10 to the 6, then obviously we would never see anything above 10 to the 6. Um, okay, so now we can take this power dependence one step further and do a power dependence at many, many different temperature points and then see whether or not we can generate a quantitative understanding of the sources of loss in the material. Um, so what we write down here, so this is a somewhat complicated, you know, non-monotonic temperature dependence, but hopefully I can convince you that, you know, these fits are quite nice. Um, so we think we understand everything that's going on in terms of every wiggle in the, in the data. Um, so our loss model is actually pretty simple. We just have some total quality factor that goes as uh, three contributions. There's this two level system saturable loss. Uh, an equilibrium quasi-particle loss that turns on as you start to approach the critical temperature of the superconductor and you just get resistive losses. Um, and then something that we're just rolling into Q other, which sets a ceiling on all of this data, which just says that as I go to you know, infinitely high powers, I don't get you know, infinitely high Q. So this uh, model has something like seven free fitting parameters and we can just fit this entire data set and it looks pretty nice. So I'm fairly confident that these are the only three sources of loss, at least in this order of magnitude. Um, so let me just walk you through what this temperature dependence comes from. So up here where all of the curves, these different power curves squish together and you see this exponential dependence on temperature, this is just quasi-particle loss. Um, and then there's this regime here where you get this strong power dependence. So these curves are far apart and you see this little gentle slope up with temperature. The slope up with temperature is just the partition function. So this is thermal saturation of two level systems that are on resonance with the resonator. 
The part that's a little bit surprising is this little uptick down here at very low temperatures. Um, and it turns out that there's actually a very simple model that's been around since like, Phil Anderson's, it feels like high school. <laughs> Since like uh, uh, since uh, you know Phil Anderson wrote down models for two-level system uh, dynamics, but basically if you assume that uh, the two-level systems themselves have a temperature dependence to their coherence time um, that arises from two-level system two-level system interactions, then uh, you get this very natural one over t scaling to the t two, and then what that leads to is a change in how much power you need to saturate the two-level systems. So effectively, you end up with uh, this uptick because you're just saturating them very readily. And the saturation powers that we see are something like you saturate all of the two-level systems in the device with 0.04, 0.05 photons. Okay, um, let me just skip over some of this. We can do independent measurements to show that, well, let me, let me at least tell you one thing. So one of the key things about this, about this fitting that's really interesting is now we can fit out this prefactor here that we're calling QTLS naught. And this thing is an interesting parameter because now this looks like a material parameter. Um, this is essentially the linear absorption associated with two level systems in the system. So this feels like the parameter that I can now use as a basis to go compare a bunch of different surfaces and materials and, and different treatments. Um, and we can do some checks to make sure that it's a good parameter. So I'll just skip through that. Um, so now what I'm interested in is this QTLS naught versus, for example, device geometry. If we think that it's surface dependent, then I should see that the QTLS naught scales with, um, with surface participation. So I just make a bunch of resonators and you know, move these capacitors away from each other. And then that blows up the mode and changes the surface participation. So when I do something like that, uh, what I get is this. This is uh, bigger is going to the right. So as I increase the pitch, uh, you know, it goes in this direction. And what you see is indeed there's um, you know, a sort of linear dependence between QTLS naught and this pitch. But then maybe a kind of you know, uh, ceilings out sort of out here that you get some saturation. Um, so then we can take it a step further and try different surface conditions. So I can look at tantalum with its native oxide. And then I can dip it in buffered oxide etch, which removes a little bit of oxide. And I see that there's you know, some scatter in our fab, but I think a clear difference between all the orange points here and the blue points here. And then for the biggest devices, everything's all mixed up, which is consistent with some ceiling. Um, and then I can make lots of different surfaces, right? And then see how do these uh, surface losses change? And then try to fit this all to a model that incorporates uh, where all of this two-level system loss is coming from. And I think the best fit to the data is that we have you know, the surface loss, but then we also have something that looks like a bulk loss that is not surface participation dependent that squishes all of these things together. Um, now, all of these surface conditions are things where we can measure things about the surfaces to know what's going on. Um, so, um, you know, for example, what we see is that this buffered oxide etch, you know, moves this curve up by something like a factor of two. So that's very exciting. Um, but then somewhat confusingly, when we try to increase the oxide thickness, which is what this triacid is, uh, we do not get a curve down here that is a factor of two worse. Um, so now by sort of quantitatively comparing these things, we can develop a p potential model for two level systems where you have at least two different sources of two level systems, your oxide and some hydrocarbon layer. And we sort of know what happens to both the oxide and the hydrocarbon layer for these different acid treatments. And we can extract a putative loss tangent that's associated with the oxide and a different loss tangent that's associated with the hydrocarbons. Um, so here's our best guess for what's going on in state-of-the-art devices. We have some surface TLS loss that looks like this. We have some bulk TLS loss that looks like this that must come from the sapphire. Um, unfortunately, that means that for state-of-the-art devices, if we kill one of these sources of TLS losses, the other one is lurking right behind, so you only get an improvement in a factor of two. Um, so what that means is that we need to make progress on both of these fronts in order to be able to improve the state of the art. And I didn't show you any data for this, but we also now have some evidence that our Joseph's injunctions are a little bit worse than our resonators. So I think there's now some uh, room for somebody to come in and try to invent new Joseph's injunctions. Um, okay, so let me skip over some of the surface spectroscopy, but let me just, um, let me just conclude by saying, you know, uh, we saw a pretty big leap in performance 
by just trying one more superconductor, right? The, the community had charitably done like four or five superconductors, aluminum, niobium, titanium nitride, niobium tinitride. Um, and, uh, and we just tried one more and we're able to get a pretty large uh, um, improvement. I can easily write down another 20 or 30 metals that superconduct at a few Kelvin and um, are easy to deposit and are relatively easy to fabricate. So I think it's probably time, particularly armed with this parametrization, for us to do a broader search um, through material space uh, for this problem. Um, okay, our current tantalum devices are both uh, bulk and surface loss limited. Our state-of-the-art quality factors at single photon powers are now around 12 million. Um, and um, you know everything that we see is two-level systems. So I think now we have to go and learn about these two-level systems and what their microscopic origin is and how to actually get rid of them. All right, so let me just acknowledge um, a lot of the people who, who did the work that I talked about. So on the NV Center side, uh, Jared Rovney uh, led the covariance sensing, um, and then Leela Rogers and uh, P. Sanctuason um, uh, really worked on this uh, on the shallow NV. Um, stuff and with a, a fairly large team. Um, on the covariance sensing side, uh, we collaborated heavily with Shimon Kolkwitz's group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, um, and then the superconducting qubits work I already mentioned is in collaboration with Andrew Houck and Bob Cavo's group, and I think I already mentioned all of these people. Um, and let me just also uh, thank a lot of our funding sources, particularly the Department of Energy uh, Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage, which is our NQI center. Um, that has really enabled a lot of this broad collaborative work in materials for superconducting uh, qubits. Um, and let me just mention, um, to try to recruit people <laughs> by way of advertising, that it is a very exciting time for quantum uh, at Princeton. Uh, we have the Princeton Quantum Initiative, um, a you know, very large set of engaged faculty across the university in many different departments. Um, we currently have junior and open rank uh, quantum searches going on in engineering. Uh, the date for full consideration was December 31st, but you know we're still reading applications. Uh, we have a postdoctoral fellowship program, uh, which is competitive and the applications are due in the fall. Um, and we also have an undergraduate research program that's really unique. Uh, you spend six weeks at Princeton and six weeks at IBM doing translational research. Um, and those applications are due in January. And then I'll just mention really briefly that um, I didn't talk about it today, but we're, we're launching a new uh, di single crystal diamond growth effort with Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, which is very exciting. We are building a lab with three reactors uh, that should hopefully be growing diamond by this summer. Um, and we're currently uh, looking for staff research uh, physicists and postdocs um, for this lab. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer more questions. Uh, so, yeah, no, so for this, uh, I would say no, <laughs> because, because we, we did, you know, this is an easy change, uh, which is just you change to this metal, everything else is the same, the qubit geometry is the same, uh, the qubit, you know, uh, functionality is exactly the same, it's just a new metal with lower dielectric loss. So does this reduce, like, the fidelity of gates, sorry, improve the fidelity of gates? Well, okay, so what, one should be a little bit careful because I think what's really the real limiting factor in a lot of processors is the two qubit gate fidelity, not the single qubit gate fidelity. So everything that I showed, which is, you know, you push the dielectric loss off, will mostly go into the single uh, qubit fidelity, which is maybe not the current limiting factor. I think, there, I think there's a lot of other problems with two, like their two qubit gate fidelity in, in I won't speak for Google's processors, but at least at IBM, uh, is worse than the coherence limit. So presumably they're limited by things like crosstalk and uh, packaging. But I guess I should say, in their case, their gates are extremely slow. <laughs> so so part, part of the problem is, you know, is with their choice of gate. I could ask another question. 
so so the, you, you mentioned that they uh, demonstrated like this great email quantum error connection, but that was with the GKP code. So it was just an interesting study. Yeah, that was. Um, that was, uh, it's in Michelle Devere's group at Yale, so they have, you know, a cavity, uh, and then they're using, you know, some bosonic continuous variable scheme, and the, the cavity is, yes. And then what they're doing is putting in a qubit that's uh, dispersively coupled to get a teensy amount of nonlinearity. Oh, so, so they, don't, they don't really care about this qubit. So, so they improve metaphorically and yeah, just immediately enters into their um, increased, uh, I guess, uh, ability to do quantum error correction with the GKP code. But at the level of one. Sorry? But at the level of one, one in code. Yes, that's right. It's, uh, it's an open question how, <laughs> how, to, how to scale. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's break even in the way that. Um, you know, their, their error corrected qubit now has a longer lifetime than the underlying physical hardware. Uh, but it is not above threshold in any quantum error correction sense in that there's no scaling. Yeah. Uh, but also, like, even the error corrected code uh, uh, doing the, uh, let's say, in a fault tolerant scheme doing gates with the two, even without concatenation. Yeah, they haven't done that Yes, that, 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 that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Great, let's uh, thank Natalie one more time. And if you have any questions, feel free to come up.